I hope everybody can hear me. My name is Marie McCauley. Welcome to UNESCO uh, Global Learning Cities Network third webinar on the topic of equity and inclusion. Um, I would ask that you please keep your microphones muted throughout the webinar. That would be really helpful for the different presentations you'll be hearing so that we avoid uh, having any background noises. So uh, I see, so I'm just going to uh, mute everybody for now. Um, so please feel free to use the chat bar today uh, through, throughout the, the different presentations. We'll look forward to reading your questions in the Q&A um, session, which will be at the end of the webinar. The webinar will be an hour long. And um, if you would like to receive the documents following the webinar, we'll be providing you with the link inside the chat bar where you can include your email address and we'll be sending you a follow-up message. Uh, that message uh, will come uh, in just a few seconds. And um, please feel free to, again, share any questions you may have. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, few welcoming remarks from uh, Raoul Kotera, uh, who is our team coordinator for the Learning Cities Network. Uh, welcome, Raoul. Welcome, welcome everyone. I would like to thank you for your participation to the third uh, Global Network of Learning Cities webinar. UNESCO Learning Cities respond to COVID-19. As we know, it is at local level that the impact of this new reality is felt. Cities have an important role to play in ensuring that all learning continue to enjoy full access to education provision, especially in the most deprived areas and homes. Many cities in response to the current crisis are intensifying their efforts in an impressive, innovative manner. In order to exchange solutions, discuss contingency plans and share distance learning approaches, Members of the UNESCO Global Network of Learning City, but also experts and no city members convened to organize these weekly webinars. Today, we will focus the discussion on a highly relevant topic, equity and inclusion. We will listen to some general aspects related to school closures affecting more than 1.5 billion learners and some ways to mitigate the effect, as well as some challenges and good practices on how to reinforce equity by assisting vulnerable groups, including aging population, people with disabilities, e-excluded groups, keeping in mind the importance of leaving no one behind, particularly in this crisis. For this third webinar, I would like to very briefly introduce my colleagues around the table. I will start uh, with uh, Mr. Harry Rinta Ahu, Deputy Mayor of ESPO in Finland. Then we will have Mrs. Jan Wang, Deputy Director, Educational Resource Data Center of Chengdu from the Research Institute of Education Science in Chengdu, China. And uh, last but not least, Mrs. Judy James, Head of Strategic Regional Collaboration in Swansea University, uh, Swansea Learning City uh, uh, in the UK. I hope that the country and regional diversity of presenters will help us to capture the richness of the strategies. I would like to introduce my colleague Marit Makuli, who will be our moderator for today and will help guide this session to make sure we come out uh, with concrete city level strategies that can be shared with our network and around the world. Marie, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Raoul. Uh, and just a final logistics note um, if everybody could avoid sharing their screen with us, that would be really helpful. We're, we're getting a few pop ups from people who are clicking the share button. Uh, we're, it's our first time uh, with these webinars using Zoom, so we're, we're working around the different tricks and uh, we would be really helpful and grateful for your um, collaboration with uh, helping us. So thank you, Raoul, for those welcoming remarks. Um, and as you mentioned, today's webinar is indeed meant to provide 
uh, a platform to discuss the different issues that have um, come up uh, on the topic of equity and inclusion in this time of crisis and we're really looking forward to hearing from the, the different perspectives of the cities today. Um, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, exacerbated uh, in ex already existing uh, inequalities and with distance and online learning on the rise, uh, we've all noticed that it's quite essential that inequalities among students stay to a minimum, um, especially for those that have little educational support and are at home and in danger of being left behind. Uh, providing students is the with the necessary equipment um, and targeting the technical assistance uh, for for access to digital learning has been identified as one of our priorities for learning cities today and as we heard last week uh, on last week's webinar minimizing inequality can also mean meeting even more basic needs uh, such as ensuring children who ordinarily receive meals in school continue to be fed as we heard was the case in sao paulo brazil so um, with that said, and to set the tone for today, I'd like to open the floor to uh, Mr. Rafael de Hoyos. Uh, Mr. Rafael, uh, the floor is yours. And if uh, you're not with us today, we will move on. Uh, so uh, we will hopefully get back to you when you are able to join us. Um, so let's just start the presentations and get right into it. Uh, we have with us Mr. Hari Rinta Aho, Deputy Mayor of the city of Espo in Finland, which is also a global uh, Learning City Network member. Uh, if you could please start your presentation and I will upload your slides right now. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, thank you. Fine, okay. I tried to do some tricks to to put my presentations here on board. Please, it takes a while. Um, okay, I'm also doing that. So let's just Okay. See. It's a bit tricky, uh, but it should come up in just a few seconds. Uh, but please go ahead and we'll, we'll upload your-, your Okay, if, if, if you could help and, and load it. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I can I can start and and, and explain it in verbally. First of all, some words of the general situation. First of all, I would like to express my sympathies, especially thinking of the situation in Italy and Spain. We are very sorry, and especially those countries are very important for me. In Finland, at the moment, we have uh, about uh, fourteen hundred confirmed infections at the moment. And then uh, this area, now you see the map, it's uh, this uh, southern Finland, Espo is located next to Helsinki, and in Espo uh, we have about uh, 300,000 inhabitants, and all this large area called Uusima has been closed because that, uh, that uh, uh, virus has uh, taken place especially in, in this area. But then let's go forward to our actual agenda. And it's uh, about uh, answering uh, to equity challenges in distance learning. My, uh, could you please turn next slide, please? Fine, thank you. Uh, my sector of responsibility is education, culture, sports and youth. And our aim is to continue providing high quality education for all, although the schools have been suspended and most of the pupils study at home. We have approximately 40,000 pupils uh, and students working at home and about 4,000 teachers. That's kind of the general idea. First about uh, our digital preparedness. Our digital preparedness before the closing of schools was on a good level. We have developed digital learning environments together with companies and partners. And of course we have provided capacity building for teachers. It's, it has been proved that it has been very, very important that teachers do have those skills which they really now need. We also have a digital platform for interaction between homes and schools. It's called Wilma and at the moment it's frequent use. And in this new situation, 
teachers are instructed to stay in contact with the poor pupils all around the day and of course with the families every day by using these digital platforms and tools. Our national agency for education and the city provides teachers with information on methods, tools and materials. And I, ho I have to also thank you our, our private publishing companies who have offered their materials for free for us. The role of the principal is highlighted in this exceptional situation. Principals are instructed to support teachers and encourage them to learn from each other. Also the role of the teacher as a guider of the learning process is more highlighted than ever. Clarity, planning and people skills are now crucial. Many teachers also share materials with each other on social media or through other platforms. Pupils access to devices is fundamental in distance learning. During the suspension, pupils who do not have appropriate digital devices can borrow a device at the school. However, now more than ever, we really can see that the school is more than a place for learning. For some children, the school is the only place where you can feel safe, interact with reliable adults or get a healthy meal. Switching to distance learning includes new risks for many. To support the most vulnerable children and young people in this exceptional situation, we have developed the following approaches. Pupils who need desperately a school lunch can pick up a snack back at the school. We started this service on Monday this week and we will develop it further. School social workers and school psychologists are available online and on phone information on how they can be contacted is spread throughout a variety of channels. They also proactively reach out to the pupils and arrange physical meetings if needed. Of course, taking into consideration the social distancing restrictions. Pupils in need of extra support may still attend school because those are the kids who can't participate the learning process just staying there at homes they really need personal guidance the government has also decided that pupils in grades from first to third and children in early education may attend contact teaching the idea behind this is that professionals in critical sectors would be able to attend work when their children are taken care of. This is especially a question of, of the doctors, nurses and so on. They are desperate and need to work in our hospitals and we have to take care of their children. And the percentage of the whole, whole cohort is that about 15% uh, of those uh, kids uh, from first to third grade are participating uh, to the ordinary lessons. Then please, next slide. And then supporting the well-being of children and, and, and youth outside the school, because this is also very, very crucial and we always, we also, we can see already now that children are very bored to stay at home and after the school lessons, they would like to come outside and start to exercise as usual activities uh, in the circumstances as business as usual. So we have to have taken some actions also. Now, when our youth houses have closed their doors, more youth workers are available on digital forums that are used by the youth. These include, for instance, video game communities 
chat services and social media. We have done digital youth work already before the current situation and now we do it even more. Some youth workers also reach out to youth in outdoor areas. And then, then next slide please. We also have a, a responsibility uh, thing of our senior citizens and we have extended the service hours at the call center for senior citizens. The city and uh, local civic organization have joined forces and started a grocery shopping service. Seniors can get in touch with the call center and get help from reliable volunteers to do the shopping for them. And I'm especially happy that some uh, members of our sports club have, uh, have been very active in that sense and uh, offering their services for free. And then one small slide yet, please. Then uh, providing support for culturally diverse population. Altogether, 155 languages are spoken in ESPO. And not all language minorities speak our national languages or English or follow the city's information channels. To reach out to all communities, we have published information and instructions regarding the virus in 10 languages. The instructions have been distributed through different channels. There are both text materials and videos. Schools have distributed information regarding education in different languages from the beginning. This week, we will open a chat box service on our website <coughs> for coronavirus questions. It will answer the questions in 100 languages. We have also started a new multilingual counseling service. For instance, library staff and volunteers answer questions by phone and reach out to communities. Since many library workers are experts on information, their competence in this way tapped into, although the libraries have closed the physical spaces. And then uh, adding something of these uh, children who have special needs, if they don't can, can't come to schools and participate ordinary lessons, there are also special support persons who try to give them individual uh, guidance through our, our, uh, our equipments. So this is uh, actually was all. I would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harita. Uh, this was really, really interesting to see how uh, the, you're relying both on, on, on a community base uh, as well as individuals to uh, pull through this pretty difficult time. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. However, I'm very aware of the time for today and we only have an hour. Uh, so we'll move on to the presentations and we'll save questions and try to group them as best as possible. Uh, for the end of uh, the, the discussion today. So with that, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'd like to move on to uh, our presentation uh, from the city of Chengdu. Uh, Ms. Yan, if you could uh, please take the floor and I'll upload your, your screen and your presentation in just a second. Uh, hello. Uh, so we're we're having. Hello, Marie. Can you uh, hear me? Hello. Thank you. I can hear you very well, and uh, I've started sharing your presentation, so you should be able to to see the slides now on the screen. Okay, I can see. It. Great. Please go ahead. Okay, dear journalists and colleagues. Good afternoon. I'm Wang Yan, a researcher from Chengdu Research Institute of Education Sciences. I live in Chengdu a city with over 20 million residents, including 3.3 million students in campus. A city only with 155 confirmed cases of the COVID-19 infected in the past three months. And a city providing disrupted online courses for all learners for free since February. Now, I'm honored to share with you the efforts 
that Chengdu has made in practices in the following two parts. Number one is what we have done to assist the disadvantaged groups and how we implemented the undisturbed learning experiments with our disturbed school, and especially with the typical case of the online digital school. Part one, measures for disadvantaged groups. First of all, the prevention and control measures in Chengdu during the COVID-19 epidemic period got more refined. For the vulnerable groups, like the elderly and the disabled people who are living alone, it's allowed for their children or specific care uh, givers who has normal body temperature and have no contact history with any infected person in the past 14 days to visit and take care of them. Moreover, community staffs gave calls to inquire the livelihoods of the vulnerable groups every day, and our volunteers were arranged to provide door-to-door -to -door services. The second point is the Chengdu municipal government issued a one-time subsidy of 300 yuan per person to low-income groups throughout the city. Number three, care for children of medical workers. In the first place, you know, the government provides the frontline medical workers a priority to choose the ideal school for their children according to their wishes. We also provide the frontline workers with opportunities to upgrade their academic qualifications for free after the epidemic. Last but not least, enterprises in Sichuan have set up the special caring fund for medical staff's children. If they need help at any time, they can call the hotline to get the assistance. So these measures are taken during the last three months to assure that the frontline doctors and the nurses can work without any worries. Number four, pay more attention to mental health. As you know, people are required to stay home for quarantine. This leads to a mental health issue to many of them. Therefore, we set up a 24 hours hotline and also providing some psychological online courses. We also offer them abundant uh, training lessons for physical challenged children. We have conducted vocational skills and rehabilitation training. Part two, how we ensure all the students access to online learning and get the good quality education. When we focus on the schooling education, all the students have to learn from home and learning online has to face two major problems. One is to ensure every student can learn online, which means teachers have to guarantee that everyone includes those from less privileged families are available to learn. The other major problem is the learning resources should be sound, scientific, and in a good quantity. To solve the first problem, the infrastructure is the fundamental step. The local government of 22 counties took actions to build the 4G fundamental equipment to make sure students can collect to the high-speed internet. The next step is to find out the students who don't have devices like smartphone, table tablets, PC, or TV. Some schools even provide devices with internet services to their students. What's more, for the technical supports, the internet service providers increase teachers and students' network bandwidth to 300 megabits per second for free. And the Sichuan TV station pushed out a free educational program. So, the students can learn at anywhere, in any time, when they not in through any terminals on their smart devices or on TV. The other problem is how students get quality personalized learning resources to meet individual academical needs. As mentioned above, with the guarantee of learning terminals, students are available to get online sources they need. For the grade nine and 12 students, most of them choose the, to learn through the live lecture provided by the Chengdu Digital School. This is a municipal network education platform, which is officially launched in July 2017 and is established by the Chengdu Education Bureau, designed academically by our research institute, had the operation support by Xinhua Wenxie. 
Currently, it has more than 1.55 million students registered. During the pandemic prevention, it imitated the normal order of teaching and learning progress and provided live classes about 36 subjects, such as Chinese, mathematics, English, PE, mental health, etc. It covers a total of 596 courses for nearly 5 million students in Sichuan province for free. I think the reason why students choose it is the quality and the personalized learning results that's brought by this online school. First, all the courses are provided not by one teacher, but by a team. You know, the, academ the academic leader of the subject from this research institute choose the most experienced teachers from the grammar schools to set up an expert subject team. Each team repeatedly discuss the teaching plan and design the online class before it can be broadcast on live. Now, over 196 experts and teachers are participating in this program, which guarantees the teaching quality. And also, we constructed the teaching environment, as you can see on the uh, PowerPoint, and provided guarantee mechanism. Under the guarantee of strict satisfaction actions, our teachers come to this digital school to shoot the class with professional staffs who are responsible for the broadcasting technology and deliver quality. Meanwhile, we also arrange staffs on duty to collect the problems and find out solutions. So far, no teacher has been infected because of this online course program and the learning resource quantity has been improved. On top of that, the most difficult problem in online learning is the interaction between teachers and students across the screen. So we designed the three point screen, which the screen is divided into three parts. So viewers can see that the two thirds of the screen as the teacher's, uh, teacher's PowerPoint. The top half of the other one third is the teacher's images and the rest of the area is the comment area. So in class, teachers can open the comment area to receive students' answers instantly. In addition, with the help of the real-time feedback of online tests, teachers can adjust their teaching speed flexibly. Additional, they view the data generated during <coughs> online teaching extremely valuable because we can form a knowledge tree for each learner who studies continuously with this data. The leaves on the tree have different colors means the different level of understanding of this knowledge, thus makes the learning process visible and personalized. Our digital class is in a double teacher's model. One teacher is monitoring the class while the other teacher from students over through is for Q&A after the class by using real-time communications. Um, this makes the instruction becomes one-to-one, -one, therefore very efficient. Um, moreover, we stick to the flipped teaching model, learning before teaching, asking teachers to provide a five or eight minutes micro lecture for students to learn before the class, pinpointing the key and the difficult points. Ms. Sandy, just have one minute to wrap up, please. Thank you. Okay, not only, thank you, thank you, Marie. Not only that, um, not but, last but not least, from my point of view, the learning right and the chance of every student should be guaranteed. And what's more important is the learning resources could be equally delivered, no matter where they are in the city or in the ru remote rural areas. To conclude, the online education practice of Chengdu digital school efforts is in fact a practice to carry out large scale personalized online education. So in this sense, the COVID-19 epidemic is not only a challenge to get over with, but also an opportunity to provide all students with high quality education. That's all of my presentation today, and I hope it's helpful for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much, Ms. Yan. This was fascinating and, and interestingly technical as well and detailed. Uh, it's great to see that you've, a, you've been able to develop mechanisms uh, in such uh, short periods for, for really addressing all the students' needs that you're working with. Uh, without any further ado, and because uh, I really don't want us to run out of time for the Q&A session, I'd like to move on now to our colleague from the city of Swansea in the United Kingdom, Ms. Judith James. Please. Okay, thank you. Okay, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you really well, thank you. Can you see me? Um, um, let me see, I can see you. Okay, so should I start? Please start, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say how sorry I am for all the people who've been affected by this crisis worldwide. Oh. In the UK, we have 25,150 positive cases and 1,789 people have sadly passed away. Wales is part of the UK and we have 1,563 cases and so far there have been 69 deaths in Wales. There are 167 cases in Swansea. I'd like to start by saying that Swansea has always had a very strong reputation for working with people in disadvantage. So I'm going to focus on the changes that have been made since the uh, coronavirus has started. So students from poor families with little support from parents well, the children normally in receipt of free school meals. The council catering team is providing 1,800 meals a day for free school meals pupils and the children of key workers receiving childcare. The schools are still open for the children of, of key workers, but it's not every school. They've designated a school in each area. So the pupils entitled to free school meals can take a daily grab and go bag collected from their nearest school or emergency childcare setting. They don't need to be on the register there for them to collect. In certain circumstances, such as self-isolation, delivery can be considered. Children without access to the internet so that they can be involved in online learning with their peers pose a particular challenge and the council is arranging for printed learning materials to be delivered to these children. Children with particular extra support needs may still attend their, their local school that's open. There are also university students who are estranged from their parents or are care leavers and they've remained in university residences and are being supported by the university staff. Vulnerable and elderly people have all been contacted by letter and told to self-isolate. They stay, have to stay at home for 12 weeks and they're getting help from Swansea Council staff working from a new helpline. The council's working with the University Health Board to put in place support for these individuals so that if they don't have friends or family or other support networks, they can get food and other essentials. The helpline number is made available to people who get the letter to stay at home. Local area coordinators in each community are also supporting these people with the support of a group of local volunteers who are undertaking shopping, collecting medicines, etc. Families of the frontline medical workers and other essential services are still attending school. So the schools in every area of Swansea have opened as a hub and those critical key workers are the health service staff, blue light emergency services staff, prison workers, social care workers, school staff and also those who work in food production and delivery. In addition to this 98 students who are studying graduate entry medicine at the University in Swansea have volunteered to provide babysitting for these staff members because all these volunteers have been DBS checked which means they've, they've had their background checked and they're also trained in paediatric basic life support through their degree and many of them carried out previous care jobs. All the council's domestic abuse hub and IDVA project continues to operate, providing safety advice and emotional support to those currently at risk. And contact phone numbers are on the council website. There has been concern that people at risk of domestic abuse who are asked to isolate within the home may be being placed at additional risk. 
We also need to consider the needs of refugees and asylum seekers. There's a Swansea Asylum Support Group, which is actively assisting and coordinating. And there are also food banks in Swansea, although many of those have been run by elderly volunteers, so are finding it difficult because those volunteers are actually now self-isolating. This raises the issue of food insecurity for, for asylum seekers. They need to subsist on £35 per week, which is a very low amount. And they can't buy in bulk because they don't have sufficient funds. And many are going to stores to find empty shelves. And it has been reported that some of the small local supermarkets serving these communities have had to raise the price of basics, such as rice, because the suppliers have raised the prices. So this is a challenge and the city is currently thinking about how to address this. For BAME communities, that's black and minority ethnic communities, funerals are a huge issue for Muslim communities. There are now concerns if numbers rise significantly, traditional Islamic burial procedures may have to be abandoned and there may be a push toward cremation. There's a need to prepare the community so support services need to be proactive rather than reactive. Also, many um, black and minority ethnic families tend to live in intergenerational households, and that needs to be considered and reflected in, in advice. So for example, how if you've got a multi-generational household, how you shield over 70 year olds within this situation. Accommodation has been offered to all homeless people across Wales. The rules for people living on traveller sites, unauthorised encampments and houseboat dwellers have been changed, so there will be no evictions during this period, and rules on continuous cruising for houseboats will be lifted, and support, specific support has been put in place for these communities. There's great concern for the self-employed who are losing their income as a result of the crisis. And <clears throat> The UK government has now agreed to provide a taxable grant worth 80% of trading profits up to a maximum of 2,500 per month for the next three months. This may be extended if needed. Um, I'd like to just quickly talk about some of the ideas that Swansea University staff have, have come up with. The staff within the College of Human and Health Science are providing training to NHS staff in critical care skills to enable them to contribute more effectively to the treatment of those with the COVID-19 virus. The entire third year of the university's midwifery degree will be assisting qualified midwives and 101 paramedic students have signed up to work with the Welsh Ambulance Service and will be supporting the service that carries out non-urgent and non-critical planned patient transport such as bringing dialysis and cancer patients for treatment. The School of Engineering staff and students have been mass 3D printing protective masks for frontline medical staff in a fight. 25 3D printers are printing non-stop and they're aiming to produce over 100 a day. The council has a website which has all the information that's required for people in the city and it also has all the contact numbers. Um, so finally, I, I'd like to close with saying I'm, I'm here as a, as a representative from Swansea University and unfortunately the deputy leader for the council, Councillor Clive Lloyd, had been called to another meeting. But I, I hope that the notes that, that we've agreed are, are helpful to people. Thank you. These are most helpful. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Um, thank you for everybody for their presentation. Uh, now it's time to open the floor for questions and we've received quite a few. Um, so just to start things off, uh, I think a question that can be addressed to all cities around the table. Um, so we're, we're talking about uh, equity and disadvantaged groups and education uh, and access to digital uh, tools, digital learning, distance learning. Um, what type of considerations have been made in your cities uh, to provide access to digital resources to those that simply do not have internet or do not have uh, nearby access to internet, do not have computers at home um, that constitute uh, severely marginalized populations? Uh, it would be great to hear maybe to start uh, from uh, the city of Chengdu and we'll move on to Espo and then Swansea. Uh, 
And if uh, if not, perhaps, uh, we might start with uh, with Espo. Um, okay. okay. Hello. Uh, first of all, the basic uh, thing that education is free for all children and and students in in Finland. So it means that it's up to the community to provide all the needed equipments. So just yesterday. Uh, with my board, I was asking that is it can you be absolutely sure that every kid has an access to the digital networks and have the needed equipments with them and and that was a situation because during this crisis, I have had only one contact by the families where the mother said that sorry, we have one computer, I need that to do my ordinary work. Could you please provide another for us? And that was taken care of. So the situation here in Espo is good. And I think that in most part of the Finland also. Thank you. Thank you for that succinct uh, explanation. Uh, and Judith, if, uh, if you don't mind perhaps giving us a few words on that. I, I, I think um, people have mobile phones, but access to the internet is not um, perfect across particularly the rural areas in wales so children in those areas would have difficulty and also children whose families cannot afford to pay the internet charges and so as a result the the council are looking at sending out um paper exercises and work for these for these children this is a, a real challenge for all of us but that at the present there's great difficulty even in purchasing more equipment so that is a problem thank you um just moving on we have quite a few questions uh, i'd like to ask um one question uh, and starting perhaps with espo as well on this one you mentioned a little bit earlier the role of a teacher in guiding students in this difficult time um how have you found that teachers are able to adapt uh in this particular role of providing guidance and reassurance to students as well as parents um and what kind of tools or systems have been put in place for these teachers to continue to guide the students and potentially if there's any tr additional training that's been provided to teachers might be interesting to hear um what has been done in, in espo to start okay thank you uh, first of all my background is that i i'm i am i have been a teacher and exercise that profession for several years uh, before becoming a, a member of uh, administration here in espo in finnish education system we have uh, a workers called student counselors they are the ones who are specialized on giving instructions how to study how to learn and nowadays, because we have also changed our national core curriculums, and those includes the idea that we should rather uh, concentrate to study more skills than just the contents. And that has uh, led us to a situation where our teachers have learned the idea that, first of all, if you want to get results, you have to uh, guide the students how to study and uh, what is the goal where they are aiming and it's not uh, the learning nowadays it's not about the memorizing a huge pile of, of details it's about to to exercise like critical thinkings and especially that that you have to take care of that your studying skills are in order and those are the actions we already have taken before this crisis started and now it's uh, make our daily life a little bit easier thank you for that and uh, judith well I, I can give an example for how communities are responding to this because one of the challenges for the children is that they're not seeing their friends and not having their normal social interaction and so what communities have been doing, and I'll take my, my community as an example, is that they have a, a daily activity that all the children are participating in. So for example, they had um, a Lego activity. The queen had lost her crown and they had to make a Lego crown. And then they took photos and posted them using their um, Facebook interaction. And this enabled the children to all talk to each other and 
compare what they were doing. They've all put rainbows in their windows. Um, they're all um, doing things like uh, making different pictures and making biscuits and all on the same day. So that they, they feel that they're sharing something. In addition, there's a lot of online activity at present with ideas for parents for home educating, uh, lots of activities to do. And a lot of these are shared. So for example, my, my granddaughter told me that she'd been doing her exercises with all her preschool class friends, where they'd all actually just had Facebook open and they'd been doing it with an online exercise. But in her mind, she thought she'd seen all her friends and been do they'd all been doing it together. So I think this is quite important that children have time to socialize and they're not just working all day, that they have, they have some set breaks during the day when they can contact their friends and chat and, and this sort of thing. Thank you so much. It's great to hear the, the kind of community building this, uh, this kind of uh, crisis can, can bring uh, and what type of initiatives come out of that. Um, we received quite a few questions and we have a, a colleague, uh, a participant, Ms. Dana Adnan, who wishes to ask a question directly. Ms. Adnan, if you could unmute yourself and ask the question to the participants, please go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for this invitation. I want to ask you something related to the well-being and mental health. Nowadays, uh, as Mrs. Uh, uh, Judith uh, say that we have something related to the rural areas and how much they are suffering and they are feeling so different because they don't have the good access to internet, how they can study and the learning distances. Although, although some uh, students, they don't have um, that skills that they can interact with the teacher uh, uh, using maybe mental skills uh, uh, or they have uh, uh, retration in this. So what we can do uh, to help these uh, students and how we can help the teacher as well. Thank you. Okay, well, it, certainly in, in the UK, in schools, as, as we heard in ESPU, there are staff who are specifically trained to help students who may have mental health challenges and who may be disadvantaged in, in a, a social interaction way. And they will know who these children are and will be in regular contact with them. Um, I know it, it sounds old fashioned, but the telephone <laughs> is a way of communicating. And also, that there's a um, paper and the post is still being delivered and this kind of thing so so i think that you know it's, it's coming down to families and communities the strength of community but also the, the schools the, the teachers are so dedicated and they have a vocation and they won't let any child be left out in that way i have a, another question please um uh, now, uh, the, the researchers, what they are saying about the effect of the learning with, uh, uh, within the internet on the students uh, uh, within at home, like how the internet can affect the students, how it can affect their mental health whenever they are sitting for so many long hours uh, in front of the TV or in front of the laptop and how, they, uh, how their well-being will be uh, after that, it will be, uh, uh, they will take a disadvantage or advantage from it. Uh, we, we've um, been very clear about people taking breaks and, and moving away from their screens and doing different activities where they can, if possible. Until today, people have been allowed to go out each day for one form of exercise. Um, I think that restriction has now tightened down and so people are only allowed to leave their home for essential supplies now. Exactly. But I, I think that it, it's up to people in a way to... In the same way as you look after your physical health, people are having to think about looking after their mental health. Not just about themselves, but contacting people that you know who may be feeling lonely, who may usually live alone, but would have gone out to shop or gone out to meet people and making sure that you phone them and contact them and find a way to make them feel less lonely. Thank you, thank you so much both uh, for that great exchange and uh, I think we have the town of Chengdu that has uh, joined the discussion once more. Miss Yan, can you confirm that you're here? Oh, uh, oh, hi. Can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you very well, thank you. Okay. Okay. 
Um, actually, I can hear you pretty well, not very well. If you don't mind uh, getting a bit closer to your microphone, that would be really helpful. Uh, we've just discussed a little bit about um, what type of um, uh, what type of what type of training have teacher uh, been given uh, in light of the quick adaptation they've had to go through to continue uh, to provide this guiding role to students even more so in this particular time of crisis. Do you have any comments you'd like to make in terms of um, how teachers have been able to fill this role and maybe how uh, they might have received updated training in response to the crisis to deal with uh, new technology or, or ongoing training, if, if you don't mind sharing? Sorry, I really can't hear you very well. Um, it's very choppy. No. No, sorry, really can't hear you. Oh my. Nope. No, sorry. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe just typing a few responses in the chat so everybody can get a sense of what uh, the city of Chengdu has been able to do with regards to teacher training uh, and teacher guiding role through the crisis to the students. That would be really helpful just because we really can't hear you. Um, so moving on, uh, I believe... No, oh, sorry. Nope. No, sorry. Oh, well, now I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you very well when you're speaking in Chinese, but... Um, we tried many times. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Yes. Just, you have one minute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, but you only have one minute if you don't mind answering right now. Yes, can I ask now? I can answer this question now. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, for the teacher training, you know, the first one is the technology training. You know, a, a lot of us teachers cannot use the technology flexibly. So what the first thing we do is to arrange them and send them the online courses about how to use technology tools, such as how to use the broadcasting tools, how to communicate with the students. And you know, the second one is our digital school, this Chengdu digital school is also uh, broadcasting lessons to students as well as the teachers who are in the ru remote rural areas so they can get uh, they can know how they could teach in their own areas mm -hmm. so as you know this digital school is also a practice that to give the teachers uh, in the rural areas the skills to how to arrange their classes uh, so that's my answer uh, it includes two points. That is, one is the technology skills, and the two is how to teaching uh, as the experiments the teachers. Uh, that's my answer, Marie. Thank you. Thank you for that very succinct answer. Uh, generally speaking, we've heard a lot about community role, and the question came up a bit earlier in the chat uh, in terms of how the community uh, networks have been used during this outbreak uh, and the question had to do with whether or not the government was the only one trying to fixing inequalities. I think we've heard from everybody today that it, in fact quite the opposite communities, uh, municipalities, people, public spaces, um, higher um, education institutions have all had a pretty significant role in, uh, in providing a helping hand to deal with the education crisis that has uh, resulted from this global health crisis. So generally speaking, um, I'll, I'll just give 25, 30 seconds to each individual participant or speaker if they wish to add a certain point on the, the importance of community um, in dealing with this crisis. Um, starting with you, uh, Ms. Yan from Chengdu. Hi, I'm here. Um, so talking about the uh, community uh, crisis, you know, we're all concerned first is the health, the physical health of all the communities, including the disabled people and the elderly people living alone. And you know, uh, we arranged, the government arranged a lot of people to help them. And uh, as I mentioned in the pre presentation that the, all the uh, volunteers were arranged to give them door-to-door -door services. And otherwise, uh, the public brochures about the hygiene uh, are published on, uh, online and offline to give the physical health uh, guidelines. And as you know that, we also give um, them uh, some lessons about, uh, uh, about cooking or about uh, art uh, and any other else. 
to help them to feel that they are happy in their home and uh, to um, uh, to uh, pass this hard time. And uh, as you all know, that is um, the mental health is the main point. So uh, we also give some give them the stories about the frontline uh, workers and uh, uh, to encourage people uh, to go through this hard time. Uh, that's my answer, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Espo very briefly uh, for a final remark on this. Yes, uh, thank you. This uh, the idea of community, since uh, it has strengthened a lot, and uh, there's a feeling that we are all in this, on the same board and we should he help each other. One nice example: my daughter is working as a medical doctor, and in a Saturday evening, the uh, nearby restaurants have prepared a meal for the doctors and nurses and they wanted to show how much they appreciate they they hard work and and my daughter told that it it was so warm feeling then when they came in and announced that they were willing to help them thank you thank you so much and judith you you made quite the point but if you'd like to wrap up with the last remark on the topic that would be great um, I think it's been very helpful in, in Wales that there has been a designated local uh, co coordinator in every community so that everybody knows who that is and that person feels that they have the authority to collate all the information about everything that's going on on one Facebook page for that community so everyone feels part of it, even if they're not actively participating themselves they know that the support is there if they need it those coordinators are doing a great job thank you thank you all very much for this uh, i'd just like to ask if our colleague from uh mexico mr rafael has joined us again and we'll just wait five seconds to see if that's the case or not and if not, um, we'll just final a few remarks from um, our team leader on uh, in the Global uh, Network for Learning Cities, Mr. Valdez Cotera, to provide a last few words and, um, and provide us with a general sense of what's to come in terms of our webinars, upcoming webinars. Raoul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for the, for, for all, to all participants for the very active contributions. We really learn a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it's time for, for learning, that's quite clear. A number of inputs were provided on how, on how cities have been responding to equity challenges. To this. Mm. Raul, we can't hear you anymore. Raul? No. Raul? Sorry, he's going ahead there, but um, let's just try to let him know. Sorry, everybody. Uh, we're clearly having a few technical difficulties and this is a little bit tricky. We're using Zoom for, um, for the first time uh, in this setting and uh, we're just trying to get a grip of it. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So I was saying, uh, please send any action or respond plans to us so uh, that we uh, may post them on our website and share with all learning cities. Uh, please note that we will have the different documents mentioned today available on our website and we'll circulate them uh, with the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. And uh, of course, I will extend a cordial invitation to everyone to the next GNLC webinar. Uh, next one will be uh, next Wednesday. Uh, so we'll have each Wednesday the seminars and the webinars, and this one will be focused on intergenerational learning, family learning, community learning. I think it's very much uh, what we're facing today. Uh, uh, just to tell you that we have some, some technical problems and we couldn't have more than 100 participants, but uh, I, I'm sure that uh, we'll, uh, the, the, the session was recorded, so we will share it with those one that could not attend. And um, 
Also, uh, many thanks. I'm willing to talk to you next week with the different uh, experts and city cases and hope that the diversity and the good cases that we heard today could be useful for your cities uh, in particular to uh, face this difficult timing. Thank you very much and see you next Wednesday. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.